All right, you guys, we're going to go ahead and get started here in just another minute. We're at the top of the hour here. We'll give just a couple minutes for a few more people to join. Looks like we already have a lot of people on, which is great. We've got a quick poll up right now, so go ahead and, and answer that. It's looking like about 75% of you have installed an IQ Panel 2 with 25% not yet. So that's great. That helps us with our audience a little bit. So go ahead and take the time to fill out that poll real quick and we'll get started here in just another minute. All right, looks like most people have voted, so we're gonna go ahead and close the poll here. I appreciate everybody who uh, who uh, voted in. So we'll close that up. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Now, hopefully uh, you all can see my screen. It looks like you can. Um, let me double check that here. Yeah, looks like you guys can all see my screen. So. Uh, really excited to have everybody on today. We've got a great uh, great attendee uh, list so far here. We've got a lot of people on. Uh, for purposes of this training, we've got everybody muted just to make sure the presentation goes smooth. But you'll notice that there is a question box that you can chat in your questions. Um, my name is Kevin Woodworth, by the way. I'm the Director of Technical Account Management for Qualsys. I will be running our technical webinar today. We've got about two hours here together, roughly. Uh, we'll see if we go a little faster than that uh, on the webinar here today. But hopefully today's training is going to give you guys a good overview of uh, of the product, and we'll we'll definitely spend some time um, going through all the different pieces, the hardware and the software, and getting started kind of some hands-on piece as best we can here on the webinar today. We'll talk about some of the testing and tools that are built in for technicians, the additional programming, how to get some support, and then of course Q&A. Um, like I said on the Q&A, there is a spot that you can type in your questions. We will do our best to answer them live as we go. Um, I may take a few here kind of on air, so to speak, for everybody, uh, but Whitney White from our marketing team will be answering most of the questions. If they're too technical in nature uh, and I can't get to them during the actual webinar, we will respond to you after the fact. So don't let that stop you from asking good questions and we'll do our best to, to get you answers as quickly as we can. Um, so uh, from the poll, looks like about 75% of you uh, had uh, have installed the panel before, which is great. And about 25% have not yet installed the panel, which which is also great. That means uh, the best is still to come for you. <laughs> so uh, really excited about today's training, and hopefully you'll learn something new here today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to talk real quickly. I got one slide on on Qualsys. I'd like to talk briefly about who we are, kind of where we come from. I feel like it sets the stage for the product, and uh, will really help you understand the product a little bit better, kind of the way we think about it and uh, allow you to get inside of our heads a little bit. It'll make you be able to, to sell the product uh, more easily, support and install the product more easily, and things like that. So real real quickly, uh, Qualsys is uh, a Silicon Valley company. We're based out of Northern California, San Jose. Uh, we were founded in 2010 um, by uh, a couple individuals who are not traditionally from the security space, and more from the technology space, but really saw an opportunity to uh, reinvent the security space. Of course, we remember by 2010, everybody was on their third iPhone. Um, it had been out for about three years. We had touchscreens appearing everywhere. iPad was out. Uh, but the security systems that were in our homes 
really hadn't changed that much. Even by 2010 standards, they were for the most part still what we uh, like to refer to as rubber number pads. There wasn't a lot of automation um, and just not a lot of, of movement in the space. So that was really kind of the impetus that started Qualsys was looking around and really seeing an opportunity for change, an opportunity to be a little disruptive and to bring something new to market. We we very early on chose to go this route through the professional dealer channel. You are our partners and we feel passionate about enabling you with the best technology to go out and compete in the modern world and uh, to provide something that, that your customers are looking for and would expect, uh, especially now being uh, 2018. Um, quickly, I want to explain some of our partners. I think, it, again, this gives you a good insight into the product and explains kind of where we've come from and who we're partnered with. Partnerships are very important in business. We know that we couldn't do it all ourselves. Uh, and so we, we set off uh, from the very early days to partner with some of the best in the business. Uh, our first partner was Foxconn. And many of you may or may not have heard of Foxconn. I, I often say they're the largest company in the world you've probably never heard of. They have a million and a half employees. They uh, build all the Apple products. So iPad and iPhones uh, are built in a Foxconn factory. Um, Dell computers and Cisco routers and Xbox Connect and things like that are all built in a Foxconn factory as well. And Foxconn is really known for uh, high quality supply chain um, and um, extremely well-built products. And you'll see that in the IQ panel when you pick it up. Uh, you'll notice the how well it's built, the components that are used, uh, even down to the fine solder points. It really is a, a very unique system built in a very unique factory. Um, and our second partner was Android. Um, you know, we partnered with Android uh, very early on. Um, and Android, of course, is an operating system. And we choose that as our base layer operating system. Um, so that's the, the software layer, the operating system that's actually running on the panel is the Android operating system. And we get a lot of leverage from Android. You don't have Software updates are key to our architecture. It's what keeps us always improving, always adding new features, staying relevant and staying up to date. And this is something that's expected by the consumer today. All of our devices nowadays uh, take software updates. We expect our hardware to actually improve through software over time. And that's something that you certainly get with the IQ panel. Our third partner is Alarm.com. And hopefully you're familiar with Alarm.com. Uh, they're what I like to call the inventors of the interactive security space. They were very early in this space. I think they were founded in 2000, um, and they're on the East Coast. Um, every IQ panel is uh, uh, an alarm.com panel, for lack of a better word. Uh, it's the only backend that we support today, so we have a very deep integration with their platform. What that means is that virtually anything you can do with the panel, you can also do from alarm.com be it turning down the brightness, adding or deleting a sensor, changing a setting. Um, and this really helps in a couple areas. One, with customer experience, making sure that the customer experience is a good experience. Whether they're using the alarm.com app or the panel interface, we want that interface to feel consistent. Or for you as an, as an alarm dealer, as a security dealer, managing your accounts over time, uh, reducing truck rolls, uh, providing good service, Having this deep, robust integration with the backend tool is the is certainly the best way to go. And then uh, a newer partner for us uh, on the IQ panel too is Qualcomm, and you've likely heard of Qualcomm. They're one of the largest chipset manufacturers in the world. We use uh, what's called their Snapdragon chipset. That's the actual chipset running inside the panel. And we're going to talk more about that chipset a little bit later, but. Uh, we get a lot of leverage through Qualcomm. They, they're basically in, the inventors of LTE. They own Bluetooth and, and many other technologies. So really great partner to have. Um, one of the things we like to, to show with the, the new IQ panel too, you know, we had our first generation IQ panel, which came out um, in 2013, 2014. And like all technology, 
it gets it just gets better and better from first generation to sec second generation and that's what you see here uh, we call it better in every way and so really nothing was left untouched whether it's the software layer or the or all the hardware that's involved it really is better in every way we go from a uh, a low def resistive screen to a high def capacitive glass screen we have a better uh, panel camera built on board it's five megapixels a much better processor we go to uh, our dual path goes from 3g to lte and from 802.11n uh, to 802.11ac 2.4 and 5 gigahertz so much better wi-fi We've got a more, a more robust sensor ecosystem with encrypted sensors, PowerG, S-Line, Wi-Fi, and Z-Wave Plus, um, better Wi-Fi connectivity, which I mentioned, better Android version, um, and a, a much better uh, user interface, which we'll talk about now. Um, so you'll notice that the panel is very thin. It's less than an inch thick. It's the, the thinnest all-in-one control panel on the market today. It has a high-def seven-inch screen, like I talked about, looks really good on the wall and something that your consumer would expect to have uh, on the wall in their home in, uh, in today's era. Um, the user interface is completely dynamic. So this was something that's completely new for us. Uh, we only show uh, the user interface that matters to the customer. So if they don't have locks on their system, we're not gonna show a page for locks. If they don't have lights on their system, we're not gonna show a page for lights. And what you'll see on, on um, other products in the marketplace is that they're kind of static. They have placeholders for everything and you might have an icon that doesn't work or doesn't function in certain situations. And with this style of user interface, it's, it's all swipe based, it's very modern, it's very sleek. It feels very familiar to their smartphone and their tablets and their computers, but it's also completely dynamic. So they're only seeing things that apply to them. Um, and then it's also designed, like I mentioned before, to be uh, consistent with alarm.com. So um, we want them to have that familiar look and feel, whether they're using it uh, on their phone or their watch or their iPad or their computer or, or the front of the panel screen. We want them to have that consistent feel where it feels like, uh, like one system. Uh, jumping inside the panel, uh, talking a little bit more technical, um, we use the Qualcomm Snapdragon chipset, which I mentioned. And this is, this is a chipset that's installed in millions of devices worldwide. It's a very powerful chipset. It's got a quad-core processor. It's got a separate graphics card. It has LTE uh, built, on, built in, so we can, we can do either Verizon or AT&T. Um, and it just comes that way out of the box, so you would either buy it with a Verizon SIM card pre-installed or an AT&T SIM card uh, pre-installed. It comes with Wi-Fi on board, so that's built into every single panel. And again, that's 802.11ac, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So we can connect to, to both networks, depending on what the network is like in the home. We get BLE 4.0, so Bluetooth Low Energy 4.0 inside every panel. And we use that for some pretty unique features, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. We've got a private access point um, or a private network built into every single panel. So the panel can actually broadcast its own hotspot in the home to connect security devices to it, things like keypads and um, cameras and things like that. And of course, we're running Android 5 and we can move forward as needed. We, we purposely stay back a little bit on Android 5, um, but we can go to 6, 7, and, and now 8 if, if needs be and really take advantage of those, uh, those newer things that are launched in Android. So this is the base layer. This is what's built into every single uh, uh, IQ panel. And it's all here on the motherboard. Every IQ panel, too, gets this, uh, gets this architecture. On top of the, uh, of the motherboard on the Snapdragon chipset, we build them what we call daughter cards. And we have four different daughter card slots. Now, this is something new for us. So if, you're, if you've been installing IQ Panel 2 to date, or if you saw us at ISC West, uh, you noticed over the last couple months, we've been talking a lot about PowerG. And for those of you that don't know what PowerG is, PowerG is uh, a technology developed by uh, a company out of Israel called Visonic. Visonic was bought by DSC, and DSC is partnered with Qualsys. So we're able to leverage through that relationship the PowerG technology, something we're very excited about. And PowerG is a wireless sensor protocol. It's um, 
fully encrypted, military grade. It's 128-bit AES encryption. Um, the sensors are two-way wireless. So historically in the security space, most sensors were, um, were not bi-directional. They could only talk to the panel. The panel couldn't talk back to the sensors. But with PowerG, we're actually able to communicate in both directions. So the sensor can talk to the panel. The panel can talk back to the sensor. That allows us to do remote configurations. So we can remotely adjust the sensitivity of a motion detector, for example. Um, it allows us to have things like interconnected wireless smoke detectors, where if one smoke detector goes off, it tells the panel that it's in alarm. The panel can then reach back out to all the other smoke detectors in the house and sound all the detectors at the same time. So wireless interconnect and lots of other really powerful things we can do with two-way wireless. Um, it's 50 channel frequency hopping. So what does that mean? Well, PowerG is in roughly the 900 megahertz spectrum, but inside that spectrum, we have 50 different channels, 25 up, 25 down, that we can actually hop between. And that significantly reduces, virtually eliminates interference uh, on the spectrum. So even when range isn't an issue, sometimes on wireless protocols, interference is. And with PowerG, interference basically goes away. We don't have to worry about that. It can, it can just hop to the best channel. And if it, uh, and then that's dynamic. So if interference then picks up on that channel at a later date and time, it can hop to a new clean channel. And then one of the really cool things about PowerG is you get about four times the range of your traditional security sensor. So really long range, which is great for, for small, medium business, um, outbuildings, detached garages, large homes, things like that. So we are very, very excited about the PowerG technology. And on our new panel, we're kind of rebranding it from IQ Panel 2. You'll start to see a bunch of branding, in fact, come out this week called IQ Panel 2 Plus. And the plus stands for Plus PowerG. Um, plus, we have a lot of other software features we're going to talk about that are included as part of that. Um, so PowerG is now the standard radio. It's now the standard security radio on the IQ Panel 2 Plus. It'll come pre-installed, ready to go out of the box. There's nothing you have to, to do. It'll just support that from the get-go, which is really exciting. Um, so that's on our brand new SKU here coming out uh, over the next couple weeks. If you have a legacy Qualsys SKU, an older IQ Panel 2, it's not going to have this daughter card installed. Um, but you can get uh, this pre-installed on the new SKU. Um, so for any of your newer installs going forward. Now, uh, we have something that we call dual SRF. And again, this new IQ Panel 2 SKU, uh, you'll see, again, you'll see us market dual SRF. Well, what does that mean? That simply means two RF technologies, two RF security technologies. So the first was PowerG, which I mentioned over here. The second is what we call uh, traditional security RF or legacy security RF. And this is going to be the uh, one of the three legacy technologies that have been around uh, for a long time, uh, for 20 to 30 years. Um, so our standard SKU will be PowerG with 319, 319.5 megahertz. And this, again, is the, the protocol, the security protocol that we've been using for quite a long time at Qualsys. It includes our legacy Qualsys sensors our Qualsys S-Line sensors, which is our encrypted version of 319. And then it's also uh, going to include any of the Interlogic sensors as well. They also broadcast on that same 319.5 megahertz protocol. So you can buy an IQ Panel 2 with PowerG pre-installed and the 319 daughter card pre-installed. Or you could get one with 345 megahertz installed. That would be uh, the equivalent protocol for Honeywell and 2 gig. So if you were doing a takeover, if you had a legacy base uh, that you've been holding on to of 345 customers, maybe they're old 2 gig customers or Honeywell customers that you installed in the past, you want to upgrade them to LTE, this would be a great way to do that. Uh, you could install new PowerG sensors while still reusing all the 345 sensors that are in their home. And then the last option is going to be a 433. Uh, megahertz radio, which is the legacy DSC protocol. So things like uh, your Impasa panel and things like that would have used a three, a 433 sensors. Those are also going to work with this panel. So you're, you're going to have to pick one of these legacy frequencies. You're going to get PowerG as standard out of the box, and you're going to pick one of these 
legacy frequencies to be pre-installed. Again, it'll come pre-configured this way. It'll be its own SKU. It'll be in a nice color box with some marketing on it. And uh, these are uh, 319 comes out here shortly, basically the end of this week with 345 and 433 to be a fast follow closer to the end of the month, early into September is when you'll start to see those become available. So again, dual SRF, Power G, Security RF, uh, very unique, very powerful in our space to be able to take over all the legacy stuff that's out there, still support that. We don't wanna have to necessarily scrap that and throw all that away. There's millions and millions of panels that have been installed on these legacy frequencies and probably tens of millions of devices. Um, but to be able to have PowerG as a standard, uh, as a go forward, super robust is something we're very excited about. Now, the third daughter card that you're gonna get on every single IQ panel two, and again, this comes pre-installed, is the Z-Wave Plus daughter card. And the Z-Wave Plus daughter card um, it, uh, supports up to 119 Z-Wave devices. Um, it's the new Z-Wave 500 series, if you're familiar with that. So it's about double the range of the old 300 series devices. It's much faster. If you've ever played with the older Z-Wave protocol and then played with a new panel with the new Z-Wave protocol, the difference is night and day. Uh, the learning process, the pairing process, the speed at which things turn on and off, um, the range you'll get out of it is much better. Now it's still a mesh network protocol and we're gonna talk a little bit later about mesh network protocols and how to properly design a Z-Wave network. So you still wanna be conscious of range. Um, Z-Wave inherently is not designed to be super far range. It's designed to be this mesh network that grows the more devices that you install. So you'll still wanna keep that in mind. Um, and then uh, lastly, I want to point out that the 119 Z-Wave devices, we break that down into specific categories of support. Um, so we don't support 119 garage door openers, for example. Um, we support 80 lights, six door locks, six thermostats, six garage doors, and what we would say 21 other devices. And another device might be a Z-Wave water valve, um, a dedicated Z-Wave repeater, a Z-Wave siren, things like that are gonna fall into the other category. So this configuration, what you see here on the screen today is, is the basic configuration for all of the IQ Panel 2 Pluses that are, that are starting to ship now. Um, and this is kind of what you get out of box. So very, very robust. Now we do have a fourth daughter card slot, which is the image sensor daughter card slot. Some of you guys are aware that this is a product made by alarm.com. It's a motion detector with a PIR, or it's a PIR motion detector with a, a built-in still camera. It operates on its own frequency, thus you need a separate daughter card. Um, we support up to five of these alarm.com image sensors, um, but you need to be aware that the image sensor daughter card and the PowerG daughter card are not compatible in the same panel. So for your older legacy panels uh, that didn't come with a PowerG daughter card pre-installed, you could buy an image sensor daughter card and add it if and when you need to. For those panels that come with PowerG out of the box ready to go, you're not going to put an image sensor daughter card in those panels. There is a similar product to image sensor that, that's on the PowerG protocol. We call it a peer cam, PIR camera. So the peer cam is, is similar to the image sensor and can fulfill some of that need if you want that on PowerG and then you still get all the benefits of PowerG. So this is the basic hardware architecture. Um, you've got the main board with the three radios, cellular, LTE, and Bluetooth. You got the four daughter cards on top, really the three daughter cards in most cases. Um, and uh, really, really robust hardware to then go build on top of. Um, quickly, I mentioned earlier the panel access point. So this is our private Wi-Fi network that's built into every panel. Uh, we like to use this to connect secondary keypads to, or we, we make a, a secondary keypad that's Wi-Fi based. Now you can connect that tablet over the home network, or you can connect it directly to the panel access point and bypass the home network. Kind of depends on the situation. The panel access point is built here to give you guys flexibility. It's not going to be a one size fits all. Some homes are large, some homes are small. Sometimes your keypad locations are really far apart. Sometimes they're closer together. Um, you're also able to pair doorbell cameras through the panel access point or, and, and video cameras, alarm.com video cameras through the panel access point. Again, 
where networking comes to play, you're most concerned about range. Um, one of the scenarios we've seen work really well is with the SkyBell doorbell camera. If that doorbell is on the front door and this panel happens to be just inside the front door, now that doorbell can talk to the panel access point to get inside the home, away from the stucco, the brick, the stone. Once you're inside the home, the panel can then deliver that to the home router. So this basically acts like a built-in extender of the uh, of the uh, the home network, but it's private. You set it up, you control the password and the SSID, and you control what connects to this. So now you, if a customer changes a router, things like that, all you have to do is get the main panel talking back to the home router, and anything talking to the main panel is going to come back up and online. So it's a great feature, um, and and some in some scenarios. Uh, really, really helpful. In other scenarios, you're still gonna to need to uh, use your networking skills and add other other Wi-Fi extenders and things like that inside the home. Uh, one of the latest features, this is a brand new feature we just launched. I mentioned earlier that software updates are important to our architecture and to our platform. And this is actually made available via software update. Now, the cool thing is, is that uh, uh, this feature um, was made available to all existing panels. So you didn't have to go out and buy a new panel, and buy new hardware to get this feature. It's just a software update. Um, we call this live answer. So live answer is answering the doorbell directly on the panel screen. And we support both the SkyBell HD and the SkyBell Slim. Um, you can set it up as a notification so that when the SkyBell is rang, you actually get a notification on the panel. You get a doorbell chime directly on the panel. And from the panel interface, you can actually answer uh, the SkyBell. So I'm not so sure if this video clip is gonna play that well uh, over, the, over the webinar here, but this is actually from my house off my SkyBell. And uh, this, this kid looks like a punk at first coming up in his black hoodie. Turns out this is actually my son's uh, 10 year old friend uh, who came over to play uh, Xbox for the day. But here we got to see that directly on the panel uh, screen. And you can see that from the panel screen, I've got several options. I can talk back and forth uh, over the microphone. I can hear him. I can talk back and forth to him. I can disarm the actual security system right from this icon here. I could unlock any of my doors. So I've got four different Z-Wave locks in my house, but I could choose to unlock the front door and let him in. And then I can hang up the call. So we're, we are very excited about this live answer on the panel. This is, like I said, a brand new feature. It was just launched about a month ago, middle of July, as part of our 2.2 software update. And now we even have a newer update, 2.2.1. Um, we say that this feature is in pilot. So pilot is different than beta, just to bring you all up to speed. We do a long beta program where we test and develop and test and develop and, and get it uh, hardened. Pilot is when we need to get the sample size up. Um, we think it's ready for the real world. We don't want to release it in full across the board, but we do need a lot more, uh, a lot larger sample size, and we think it's pretty much there. So that's the that's the phase we're in now is pilot program. If you want to opt in to the live answer pilot program for your panels or any of your customer panels, you can do that. All you have to do is talk to your alarm.com rep. They will enable it on your dealer account. And once it's enabled on your dealer account, then on an individual customer level, you can choose to, or the customer can choose to activate this on their panel. It's a privacy permission. So they get to choose what shows up at their panel and when. So we're very excited about Live Answer. Now, the other new feature that was just launched is Live View with audio. So again, we had Live View in pilot status for about the last six months. This new version actually adds audio. So Two of the Alarm.com cameras actually support audio, the 521 indoor camera and the 522 indoor camera. Um, and I think the new 622 PT they just released last week also supports audio. So those three cameras are supported and will uh, get audio through the panel. You can talk back and forth. In this case, you can see we're checking in on the kids in the playroom here and we could, we could actually talk back and forth or just choose to hear them if we wanted to. Um, we do support the vast majority of alarm.com cameras on just standard live view, even the non-audio cameras. So the uh, the 722, the 725, the 726, the 825, and the 826 are all supported as part of this feature. And again, uh, this is something you just have to opt in for with alarm.com. So ask your alarm.com rep. They will turn it on just like live answer. 
they will turn on live view for you and then your customer can choose which cameras they want to show up here so if they have multiple cameras they can choose to have all of them show up on the screen uh, one at a time of course um, but show up in the list to select or they can just choose certain ones maybe there's a privacy reason they don't want specific cameras to show up on the screen they don't have to do that um, so lots of options here with live view um, one of the other things that just launched this is one of my uh, kind of pet projects that i'm really excited about um, myself coming from the installer world I, I used to have about 400 installers uh, working for me and uh, you know training was always difficult uh, at that level we tended to uh, see a lot of new people come and go um, and uh, so Qualsys has built what we call an easy install wizard and this wizard actually can be launched when the panel first powers up and it walks you through all the programming steps so uh, for, for ProTex, uh, this really helps keep it, I call it fast, efficient, consistent, right? So this speeds them up, uh, it brings everything to the front. They don't have to go deep into different programming menus. It'll walk them through everything and it will do it in a consistent manner. So even for the good guys uh, who've been doing this a long time, we tend to forget things, we get in a rush. Uh, sometimes we miss stuff. And so this really brings everything and kind of walks you through page by page couple dozen pages on how to set up the system it does some really nice system checks it'll check your power run for you it'll check your battery for you it'll check all your daughter cards for you make sure everything's ready to go it'll automatically run a cell test and give you a cellular reading on the panel it'll walk you through connecting to the customer's wi-fi which we see missed quite a bit so that's a big one um, because remember uh, you need wi-fi in order to do a software update um, so wi-fi is big and then walk you right through adding sensors and z-wave and everything else right on through the end even setting up user codes if you want so the other nice thing there's a lot of interest uh in our space right now about getting into diy maybe you're a dealer who's looking at offering diy as part of your portfolio we sometimes call that professional configuration self-installation so these are systems professionally uh, set up by you uh, monitored by you um, just simply installed by uh, the homeowner and having an install wizard walk the homeowner through some things really helps open up some of the DIY opportunities for our dealer community. So we're excited about that as well. Uh, of course, we have uh, language translation on the panel and we support three languages. We support English, French, and Spanish. We have what we call a bilingual uh, language toggle. It's a simple button. You get to choose between two languages. So if you're in Canada and English, French are kind of the the thing up there you can simply uh, toggle between english and french very easily the whole panel will toggle if you're in an area of the u.s where there's a lot of spanish speakers being able to easily uh, toggle between spanish and english uh, is is pretty powerful so that's just built right in our dual path I, I hit on this a little bit earlier but every panel has dual path built into it that's wi-fi and cellular uh, and a lot of people ask is that you know which one's primary which one's secondary you know if the how long does it take for the first one to fail before it goes over the secondary we don't actually do it that way we do uh, simultaneous communication over both paths um, that creates a really robust user experience in the home you know 99 percent of the time these systems aren't being used uh, to transmit alarm signals they're being used to transmit lights locks armings disarmings all kinds of different bits of data and uh, if they're in an area where cellular coverage is less than stellar uh, wi-fi uh, having that on board all the time really makes the panel behave nicely in the day-to-day -day. Um, it creates a very nice user experience where everything reacts fast um, not to mention you have these redundant paths which are which are much more secure and reliable um, one of the other things we think a lot about is uh, is investment protection you know the the business model for the security industry is really built around oftentimes uh, installing equipment uh, most of the time at, at, at a loss up front whether that's because of sales commissions or installer payroll or, or physical cost of the hardware typically you're not covering all of your costs uh, day one and so having something that is um, robust for the long term is is very important to protect your investment we do that through lte which stands for long-term evolution so we know that'll be good for a very long time we've got forward compatible hardware with daughter cards 
Uh, for example, you've seen us introduce PowerG 18 months after launching the panel. That's something that we're able to just add through, the, through uh, forward compatible hardware over time. And then of course, the flexible updatable software, uh, really keeping it relevant now and into the future. One of the other things I'll touch on briefly is, is the actual security of the platform. We wanna make sure you understand how seriously we take security. Um, and we do that at a lot of different levels. We do it at the sensor level with encrypted sensors. We do it at the panel level with visual verification from the panel camera. Uh, we've got jam detection. We've got um, you know, token-based authentication between the alarm.com cloud and the Qualsys cloud in the panel. We've got a built-in firewall. Uh, the version of Android that we use is actually called SE, stands for Security Enhanced. So a very robust version of Android that's all locked down. Uh, Bluetooth disarming is much more secure than, say, a legacy key fob, um, which would openly, through the air, broadcast a, a disarm command uh, on the old school key fobs. So we don't, we don't have that anymore. Um, and uh, just we really take security very seriously. We're, we're in a modern day and age where it's kind of a matter of, of uh, if, not when. And so this is, this is something that we, that we take very seriously and important to us. It's a very robust product from a security perspective. We hire third-party pen testers and go through all kinds of different processes to, uh, to see if it can be hacked. Um, one of the other really unique things, uh, I want to introduce a concept to you. Uh, called soft sensors or, or sensor apps or virtual sensors, sometimes we'll call it. And there is a phrase, it was coined a couple of years ago by a guy named Mark Andreessen, um, uh, who's kind of, uh, call him the godfather of the internet. He was at Netscape in the 90s. He, you know, sits on the board for HP. He's got a venture capitalist firm called Andreessen Horowitz in Silicon Valley. And, um, really kind of well-respected in his space. He said software leading the world. And although he wasn't really talking about our space and our industry, we kind of took that to heart. And we thought of, you know, how can, what can we do with that in our space? What can we do with, with, with software that would kind of be a paradigm shift? Um, and that's what we did. So we have a, every panel includes a glass break detector built into the software. You could think of it like an app. It's actually just a setting. You go in and you turn it on um, and you get a, a really nice glass break detector. Now, this glass break detector isn't going to replace all the glass break detectors you're ever going to install. Placement is key with all glass break detectors. So the panel needs to be in an area where it would make sense. Uh, this has about a 15 foot range. So if it's in a kitchen, quite possibly that could work well. If it's by a front door with a side light or a transom window, that could work well. And you're gonna figure out different scenarios where, where this is really beneficial to you. Um, but being able to have a glass break on board, essentially for free uh, as, as part of every single system, we think is, is pretty unique and, and robust. And it may even lead to helping you to upgrade and sell more glass break detectors in other parts of the house. You know, hey, I've got, uh, this glass brick detector here is part of the control panel, and that's protecting this set of windows. Let's talk about these other sets of windows on the other side of the house and how we could protect those. So we really see this as a nice segue and, and a really nice product. A um, couple things on it. Um, it used to be that we would only uh, enable this glass break in away mode, whereas most glass brick detectors were traditionally uh, utilized in stay mode. Uh, we've recently changed that, another example of software updates, adding new features over time. We got enough data, we felt confident enough to be able to enable this in the home when other people would potentially be there, meaning stay mode. And we now actually support the glass brick detector in stay mode and in away mode, and that's a programming setting, so you choose how that gets set up. Uh, the other thing we looked at was the actual uh, key fob. And I mentioned uh, kind of the weakness of key fobs a few minutes ago, the fact that historically key fobs have just transmitted a disarm command over the air. And, uh, you know, if I had a little SDR, software defined radio, 
you can build for about 20 bucks. I could capture that uh, code through the air. I could replay it at a later date and time. And I could uh, genuinely disarm just about any security uh, product in the market today. Um, and so we looked at that. We didn't like that. So one, our key fob is now encrypted, so you can't do that. Uh, and two, we went off and built what we call uh, Bluetooth disarming. You know, we had Bluetooth on the panel as part of the Snapdragon chipset. And we thought, well, everybody has a fob in their pocket. It's called their smartphone. Let's see if we can utilize that smartphone out, outside of the app experience and do kind of a proximity tag, um, near field RF detection, where we can actually sense that their smartphone's in range and simply disarm the system based on Bluetooth. So we support up to five smartphones. Um, and uh, it's from armed away. So they would arm away, they would leave. When they come back, the panel senses their phone, automatically disarms. That's an, that's an encrypted connection uh, via Bluetooth. It's not broadcast in, in plain language over the air. Um, and uh, this has been one of our most exciting features. People have really adopted this well. Um, a lot of customers like this. We call this uh, seamless disarming. So you just come home, you have this magical experience where uh, your panel authenticates you based on your phone, your lights can turn on, your door can unlock, your panel can disarm, and a lot of these rules and events and scenes can really happen around uh, your presence uh, in, in fairly close proximity to the panel. It's about 30 feet roughly, 20 to 30 feet is kind of your typical Bluetooth range. Um, so that's been a big success. And then the other thing we did was we uh, decided, well, what about motion detection? Well, we have a camera on every panel and cameras to a lot of degree have the ability to, to sense uh, uh, motion. Now, I wanna be very clear here. This is not used, we don't use our panel camera as a, what you might traditionally think of as a PIR, uh, you know, a passive infrared, uh, burglary detection device. That's not what we use it for. Uh, we use it for what we call presence detection. So this is not going to set off an alarm. It's not going to dispatch the police because it's not a PIR. It doesn't have the reliability that a PIR has because it's based on pixelation change. But it does become a data point in the home. And as we see more and more data points in the home, we can do more and more things with that data. Maybe we use that for alarm.com wellness. Maybe we know if your elderly mother is up and about and moving inside the house. Um, maybe we use it to drive a rule, turn on a light or perform some other type of function via Z-Wave. So this just becomes a data point in the home. And again, all three of these things are optional. They're all inside settings. They can be turned on or off based on need uh, at the individual home, but we're really excited about that as well. Uh, here's a quick example of the uh, the built-in glass break detector on the panel. Uh, here's the uh, the Bluetooth touch that's disarming. You'll sometimes hear us say, "Leave your phone in your pocket um, or in your purse." In the in the example of the uh, the infographic here, um, and again, it can just seamlessly sense uh, uh, whose phone is there and and how it got disarmed, and that's all recorded in the history. This is a video I'm going to skip because it won't play very well, but that was an example of, uh, of Bluetooth disarming. And then one of the other things we like with Bluetooth disarming is we kind of couple this with geofencing. So if you're familiar with geofencing, geofencing is a feature from alarm.com that allows you to do all kinds of actions based on the location of your phone. Now geofencing uh, by its nature isn't as precise as, as Bluetooth disarming. Uh, so we like to use geofences when you leave the house. So if you get a half a mile or a mile away, maybe it, it tells you, you know, maybe it turns down the thermostat or sends you a reminder to arm your system or uh, does some type of action on geofence. And then when you actually come home and you're in your driveway on your front porch, very near field, you use Bluetooth touchless disarming to then do the opposite. That could turn your thermostat back up. It can disarm your system. It can turn on a light or unlock a door, um, things like that, all based off of the uh, the disarm routine of the of the panel. And again, you can pair up to five five phones. Here's an example of the panel camera as a virtual motion sensor. Um, and let's talk a little bit more about the panel camera. So, what else do we use the panel camera for? Primarily, we use it for something that we call disarm photos. And uh, every time the panel's disarmed, we actually take a picture of who did the disarming. 
we can send that out into the alarm.com ecosystem. So that means you can get it on the panel, you can get it on your phone, you can get it in an email or a text or push notification, you can get it on your Apple Watch, um, and you get to actually see who disarmed the panel and when. So rather than just knowing code 1234 disarmed the system, you get to see a picture with that, which is great. And then the other thing that we do with the panel camera is we actually take an actual video during an alarm event. So we call that alarm videos. So if the alarm goes off, the siren is sounding for four minutes, we actually just turn on the uh, turn on the camera and we start recording. Um, now that recording is a little bit too big for us to send out into the alarm.com ecosystem today. We're working on getting that compressed and sent up to the cloud. So for now, uh, disarmed photos will push out to the cloud, but alarm videos are stored locally on the panel. So that's a, a key difference. If you're installing it, make sure you're aware of that. Uh, we have a few uh, really nice uh, technician tools, uh, tools that are built right into the panel to help with installation. Uh, probably my favorite tool is what we call the advanced sensor test. This is something that we developed over many, many years. Um, you know, we used to we used to talk a lot about um, our integration with alarm.com saying you can fix things after the fact remotely. One of the things we're focused on here is you don't want to have to go back and fix things after the fact or even fix it remotely. You want to get it right before you leave. And that is so true with this sensor test. Um, again, having been an installer myself for a very long time, um, one of the things you always do as an installer is you stick a sensor up. Maybe you would do kind of an old school packet count sensor test. Um, most likely, you probably just chimed it. And if it, if it chimed, you know, you kind of assume it works. You cross your fingers and you hope you never come back. Um, really with the advanced sensor test, we're, we're doing what I call making the invisible visible. We're actually showing you in, in reality for that exact environment, how strong is that sensor, sensor transmitting and being received by the receiver at the actual panel. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this as we get into the technical aspect of it. But again, this test dynamically adjusts for every single home based on the noise, the environment in the home, things like that and being able to actually plot this on a graph and see how strong the sensor is. Should you leave it? Should you move it? Should you add a repeater? Things like that are all able to come into consideration with this tool. Uh, another uh, tool, we've had this for some time, is our Z-Wave diagnostic tool. Again, making the invisible visible. Z-Wave for a long time has been uh, kind of mysterious and difficult. Uh, techs knew that it was short range. Techs knew that it was a mesh network. And so when something didn't work, they basically went to their truck and they started grabbing inventory, right? And they would get lamp modules or, or Z-Wave repeaters and just kind of start plugging them in all over the place, hoping to build a mesh network that was robust enough and reliable enough to, to perform over the long term. That means a lot of equipment usage. That means a lot of extra costs sometimes. And that means oftentimes, uh, historically, a lot of service calls trying to get it right. And so we have four very unique Z-Wave tools that we've built in. We'll talk about that in the Z-Wave section that allow a technician to physically design a Z-Wave network and not, uh, not just guess at a Z-Wave network, um, but they can, they can physically design it, see how it's performing and, and set it up and, and kind of adjust it on the fly uh, the first time. We have a bunch of other system health uh, uh, diagnostics on the panel, things like your cellular and your Wi-Fi and your different daughter cards and uh, test for the panel glass break and things like that. And then we have a whole line of PowerG devices. And this, this is a slide here of the new IQ Panel 2 Plus that I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation. So here you see these would be our SKUs for the PowerG 319 which is Qualsys and Interlogix. We, met, we offer that in Verizon, AT&T, and TELUS for Canada. Um, PowerG 345, which would be, again, Verizon, AT&T, or TELUS. And then PowerG with uh, 433, or the DSC protocol. So three different panels with three different carriers, lots of options, lots of flexibility uh, to meet your installation needs. Um, our secondary Wi-Fi keypad works with all three of these SKUs or all nine of these SKUs. Um, we support 
uh, virtually all the PowerG devices. Uh, for those PowerG devices that we don't support yet today, we're, we're working on adding more and more over time. Um, so we've got a list of those uh, on our website. And uh, this is, we're just really excited about this architecture and this platform here. It's gonna be really great. We still have our legacy SKU with our S-Line 319 devices as well. Um, and our uh, secondary keypad. Um, lots of different devices, several different styles of door windows and uh, different transmitters that are out there. So a full line of, of devices that you'll need for your installations. That kind of wraps up what I would call the overview section. So hopefully you guys are feeling like uh, you have a good overview of the product. That was kind of like drinking from a fire hose. We're moving pretty fast here, um, but I want to make sure we have time to get into the actual technical aspect here. Um, so. You kind of understand the features. Hopefully you understand the benefits, some of the technical stuff that's built inside. There's a lot there. There's something for everybody. Um, what we're going to do here for the next little while, we've been going for, let's see here, about uh, just under an hour, about 50 minutes we've been talking here, which is about right. We're going to spend the next hour, hour and 10 minutes here, kind of on uh, what I call tips and tricks, um, best installation practices. We want to make sure that, um, you guys feel comfortable installing this. For those that have already installed it, or 76% here, uh, that have already installed the panel, hopefully you'll learn something new here. Maybe you'll get a little insight into, oh, that's why the panel did this, or that's why the panel did that in this circumstance. For those that are brand new, super critical you pay attention. We're gonna cover some of these best practices here. And uh, we have seen through lots and lots of training tech support calls. We've got a whole technical account management team that goes out and travels and trains and manages relationships with many of you um, through this whole feedback loop that we get from our dealers, including webinars like today, including questions that you're, that you're asking live right now. Uh, we get a lot of feedback and we're always improving the product and we're always trying to talk about our best practices. And um, so that's what we're going to cover here. The next little bit is uh, how to install it, some of the best practices that'll save you time, save you money, um, and save you service calls later down the road. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that here. Um, real quickly, you guys, uh, the next couple slides for the most part are directly out of our installation manual. So I highly recommend you download that. I always like guys that, that like to read, believe it or not. Um, we've got a lot of good documentation, a lot of information. Um, so. We'll, we'll talk about some of this directly from the manual for a little bit. If you look at the hardware, this is pretty self-explanatory. You got your panel camera, you got your dual microphones on the bottom, your page indicators, these are dynamic, right? Your user interface, your status LED can be red if it's armed or, or green if it's disarmed. If you flip the panel over and you were to look at the back, there's a few design elements I wanna point out. Uh, the first is the mounting. So. These two holes were meant to mount here to a single gang box or directly to sheetrock. But if you have a mud ring, maybe it's a builder program, maybe it's a pre-wired home, um, you can mount it right to a single gang box. This fits a double gang box and this fits a triple gang box. So, or, or you can do center justification, left or right justification on a single gang box. So lots of flexible mounting options. Here you see the microphones. There's an actual uh, optional locking screw on the bottom so you can lock it uh, so that it's much more difficult to take off the wall. Really great for light, light commercial applications or applications where they got lots of little kids, things like that. You got your micro SD card slot on the side. I'll go back here. Um, your sirens built in. You have two different speakers. So lots of options for sound on here. The speakers are used for voice and chimes. The siren is used for the burglar siren. If I was to remove the back cover, this is actually what you're gonna see. And this part here that says expansion, expansion slot, I haven't updated this slide yet, but this is where the Power G card comes pre-installed. You saw that on the previous slide. Here's your security RF, your SIM card pre-installed, your Z-Wave radio and your optional image sensor radio. You've got two cellular antennas built in, one up here and one on the side. This is your diversity antenna. We get really good cell signal, typically you know, one bar higher, sometimes two bars higher than most cell phones. So really great cell signal. This image sensor antenna is also used as your power G antenna. That's the reason that you can't run both cards simultaneously. We only have one 900 megahertz antenna right now. 
Um, and this gets really good, that helps with that really long power G range, that 4X range built there. Your lithium ion battery and your terminal block. Now, at the bottom, again, I mentioned this is a screenshot directly from the install manual. At the bottom, there's a big red note that says, warning, don't ever disconnect the battery. And usually in our in-person classes, we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, keep in mind, this is a, a computer, right? This is running an operating system. So it's sometimes writing things to the memory or, or doing all kinds of different processes. And some of the things we see with techs is, uh, and, and no fault of their own, kind of the number one troubleshooting routine. If I've got something funky going on with the panel, if I've got some problem that I don't quite understand, my first instinct is gonna to be to power cycle it, right? And we do that, we do that with computers, we do it with game stations, we do it with phones, we certainly do it with alarm panels. And historically with alarm panels, if I was gonna power cycle something, I would get out my screwdriver and I would unplug the battery and I would unplug the transformer. I would power the whole thing down and I would power it back up. Um, and in, in our world, we would call that a hard reset, right? So if you think of this like a phone or a computer, you typically wouldn't do that with your phone or your computer. Instead, you're gonna go into the actual software. And in the software, we built a button, a power down button. So if you wanna power down the panel, you would just do that from the software rather than just unplugging the, the battery or the transformer. If you wanna power cycle the panel, you would do that from the software. So we actually have a power cycle built in. You know, keep your tools in your tool bag, no need to, to bust out a screwdriver or anything like that. You can just simply go in and, and power cycle it or panel reboot it right from the software, which is nice. So we call this a soft reboot. Now there is a way to hard reboot it if, and 99% and, and of the time, you know, if something pops up, if you have a problem, this soft reboot is all you'll ever have to do. Uh, very rare to even need to use this quite frankly, but if for whatever reason the software was having some type of catastrophic failure and you wanted to hard reboot it, well, you could either press and hold down the side button for 30 seconds, or at that point you could unplug the, the battery and the transformer. We just don't want you to do that as your first resort. We do have really good backup mechanisms. We have um, backup partitions and backup drives, and you know we can recover from just about anything. Uh, and the panel's really, really smart, but as a best practice, uh, as a matter of course, if you're going to panel reboot it, do it from the software menu first. And if you're still having problems, then go ahead and power it down, unplug the, un, you know, unplug the AC, unplug the battery, power it back up if you have to. So that's just something I like to touch on solely because coming from the world of technicians, you know, our number one thing is, tr is troubleshooting mechanism is power cycling. And I want to make sure you know how to power cycle the product properly. Okay, let's talk about the wiring diagram. So as I get into wiring here, and I'm gonna physically run my power wire, I've got two options. We ship this with a transformer and with a five foot cable that has a barrel jack built into it. So if you're just dropping to an outlet directly below the panel, you can use our included cable and, and use the barrel jack. If you're running your own wire, maybe you need to plug in further away or you wanna run down to a basement outlet or something like that, or a closet outlet, something like that, you can go ahead and run your own wire. And we have this toolless terminal block built into the panel. It's, it's, it's labeled for you, and then even beyond that, one is red and one is black. So that's your positive and your negative. We use a DC transformer. So it's not an old school AC step-down transformer. It's actually a modern, very efficient power supply, which is a little different than a transformer. It's 12 volt or it's a 5.5 volt power supply, excuse me. And uh, so you want to get your positive to your positive and your negative to your negative. Now we do have a protection circuit. If you hook those up backwards, you're not likely to cause any damage, but it's not going to charge either. So you'd want to go ahead and fix that. Um, one key thing here, you're going to see over again, this is right out of the installation manual. This big note in red here. If you're running a custom length wire, this is a power wire, you guys. This is not an old school bus keypad wire that's just powering a 12 volt keypad. We're, run, we're charging a battery, we're powering a cellular radio, we're powering a Wi-Fi radio, we're powering a touchscreen, Z-Wave, PowerG, all this stuff, right? So we wanna make sure that it's effectively powered. And so we recommend 18 gauge wire, no longer than 25 feet. If you'll remember back to your, uh, you know, your NBFAA level one class that you likely took, um, You'll remember about electrical theory and you'll think back to voltage drop, right? Anytime we 
run voltage along a really long wire or a really skinny wire, that resistance of the wire is going to cause the voltage to drop. So if at my transformer I have five and a half volts and I run it along a really long or really skinny wire, maybe a 22 gauge wire longer than, you know, longer than about 40 feet, you know, we say 25 feet in the manual because we want to give you lots of room to power it. But realistically, you can go further than that. If you run it much further, though, you're going to end up, you're going to start with five and a half and you're going to end up with like four and a half over here at the panel or down into the four. And if you get below about 4.6, 4.7 volts over here, you're not going to be properly powering the panel. So if you've got a meter, you can measure for voltage drop. Um, safest thing to do is run as thick a wire as you can, 18 gauge, and keep it as short as you can, no longer than 25 feet. So that's something on voltage drop. I'll give you a sneak peek here since we're pretty close on it. Usually I don't like to talk about future stuff. We are coming out with a larger transformer. Uh, later this fall, we'll move from a five and a half volt transformer to a seven volt transformer. That'll take this from about 25 feet to about 100 feet, uh, if not further, but we'll spec 100 feet. So we're going to give you guys a little more option as far as takeovers, builder runs, things like that, where, where you may not have the optimal wire ran. But if, if you're using your own wire, you should use 18 gauge and keep it as short as possible. That's just the best practice, regardless of the electronic you're working on, right? You wanna make sure you don't have too much voltage drop, you don't wanna create heat along that wire, and uh, you wanna properly power your device. So now, quickly, we do have two other hardwire inputs directly on the panel, so you can, you can wire them in. They're normally closed or a closed loop circuit, I like to call it. Um, they take a 4.7K resistor, um, doors, things like that. And we have a, an open collector that pulls voltage to ground for like an exterior siren. You'll notice that we are not natively powering the siren off these terminals. We don't have 12 volts here to power the siren. So you're gonna use a separate power supply and you're gonna run the negative lead from the siren through the open collector and back to the power supply. That's pretty easy to do if you need to do that that way. But we can uh, control a much larger siren about 300 milliamp is all that you wanna run through there though. Don't run a big one amp horn through this little relay or you'll fuse it uh, either closed or open and then your siren will be going off all the time or it won't go off at all. So be conscious of uh, how much current you're running through, through here without a separate relay at least. Okay, on the software, you've got kind of three major components here. You've got your header and your settings tray on the top, your primary user interface, and your page indication and the emergency buttons on the bottom. If we kind of talk, focus on the header up here at the top, you've got weather, you've got time and date. These are automatically set by alarm.com based on the zip code the panel's installed in. We get the weather from the National Weather Service and we get the time and date based on the zip code as well. You've got a little envelope up here in the upper right-hand corner. This is the default user interface of this envelope. Inside this envelope is gonna have your contact us it can have dealer information we actually have video tutorials built in so about 15 or 16 different videos on how to use the product that customers can watch and there's also a space for messages alerts and alarms we call these red bubble alerts these will be things like low batteries failures troubles anything that's kind of going on with the system they'll have a red bubble alert right there um, this icon right here, this envelope icon, can actually be swapped out to your dealer to your dealer icon. So this can be branded as your panel right here in the software. That actually gets pushed from alarm.com. So if you don't know how that works, uh, contact your alarm.com rep and work with them on that. Um, and they can they can kind of help you get set up. You'll send them your logo. They will host it on their back end. And when the account gets created and first talks to the back end, it'll actually push down automatically. There's nothing you have to do. It's kind of a one-time setup, and then you're gonna get that. Um, if you were to swipe down from the top, you'll see this little bar, there's a swipe down. We call this the settings tray, and this is one of the unique features of the, of the UI, the user interface, that we really like. And a couple things, a couple tips and tricks that installers usually don't know about is these top icons up here, the battery, the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, the cellular, these are all touchable. So you can actually touch each icon and you'll get a status readout with some more information. You know, battery charging 95%, for example. Wi-Fi connected, um, you know, to uh, Smith Home. 
um, Bluetooth on, uh, cellular, four out of five bars of Verizon, things like that. You have the status of the system, and no matter where you are in the system, you can swipe down from the top UI, you can touch the status right here, and it will jump you back to the home page, no matter where you are. You have quick access to your master volume slider and your brightness. You've got settings, messages, alerts, your photo frame settings, clean screen, and your language toggle, which I talked about. In this case, it's set to Spanish. So let's go into the settings icon because this is where most of the programming is gonna be done from. And if I touch the settings icon, I get oh, seven or eight different settings here. And these are all settings that are fairly benign. Um, these are settings that don't require uh, the protection of a master code or a dealer code or an installer code. So I can change from Fahrenheit to Celsius. I can look at the status of my sensors. I can um, do several different things. Um, but I want to focus on advanced settings. So the last icon, the cog, is going to be advanced settings. And when I get into advanced settings, I have a couple ways to get in. Uh, I have the master code, one, two, three, four. That's the default. That'll let me in, and that'll give me pretty limited access to what I can do. That's designed for an end user. They can change user codes. They can change some sound options. They can connect to their own Wi-Fi network, and they can run a few system tests and things like that. But for the most part, it's pretty limited with 1234. The main uh, installer and dealer codes, though, are going to be the ones that you, you will use to get into programming to access everything. And the default installer code is 1111. The default dealer code is 2222. About the only difference between the dealer and the installer code is the dealer code has access to a couple more options. Things like master resetting the panel back to factory defaults, things like changing the dealer contact information on the panel, um, and a few other miscellaneous settings that, that the dealer code has access to that the installer code does not. So either one of those, by and large, are going to get you by for, for the bulk of your programming. Okay, so let's talk about actually getting started. You're at a home, you've got your inventory, you've got it out from your truck, it's on the counter. What do we do next? And this is generally, if you were here in one of our in-person classes, we would do a lab. We would get out a bunch of inventory and we would actually do all this together hands-on. Um, where we're on a webinar here, we're not gonna do that, but we are gonna do our best to kind of give you an idea of uh, some of the tips and tricks and best practices of actually installing the product. So first, That said, this quick guide was built uh, for a very specific reason and in a very specific order. And it's designed to be as simple as possible. It's 11 steps. It's a single page. It's not even two-sided. It's one page. <laughs> and if you follow these steps in order, and if you actually read this, this is going to have, for the most part, all of our best practices, tips, and tricks. So if you get on your first job, if you've already done a job and you've never looked at this sheet, I encourage you to pull this out on your next install and to follow these steps in this order. And I think you'll find it goes really smooth for you. So we're going to go through each of these steps here today and talk about each one in a little bit more in detail. So the first step is obviously get it on the wall. And you know I don't have to teach you guys how to screw a panel to a wall or how to fish a power wire, but there are a few things I want to teach you about getting the panel on the wall and getting it closed. First, you're gonna open it up and you're gonna screw it to the wall. Again, we've got those six different mounting locations. You're gonna use up to five of these mounting locations, but you're gonna leave this lower right-hand screw hole open, okay? And that's because we have this white, this little white, we call it an RF pigtail antenna. It's about six or seven inches long. That is actually designed to go inside the wall through that screw hole. So you'll, you'll screw this to the wall, you'll drill a little quarter inch or, or one eighth inch hole in the wall. Um, I see a lot of guys take their little precision screwdriver and just punch a hole in the wall. That's fine too. Um, and you're gonna actually route this antenna down inside the wall. Now, this is of the entire presentation today. Um, 
you know, we're going to be talking here for two hours. If you remember nothing from my two hour presentation, except this, this is the one thing you have to remember. You must absolutely must get this antenna routed down inside the wall as cleanly as possible. This directly affects the signal strength of your legacy RF, right? So this isn't going to matter for power G, but this will matter for your 319, your 345 or your 433. The panel is so thin and there's so much going on and there's this big screen and there's all this shielding, but in order to get really good RF range, we need to get this away from the panel down inside the wall. And so the very first thing uh, that I ask when someone calls me and says, hey, I had a sensor going to RF failure, the very first thing I say is, what'd you do with the RF pigtail antenna? And typically their response is, you know, what, what, what antenna? I didn't see an antenna. And they've either, cut this off, they've jammed it up inside the panel, they thought it was the cell antenna, um, they didn't know what it was, and that's because they didn't read the quick guide. Um, so make sure you get this down inside the wall uh, as best as possible. And if you're on an insulated wall, I even see technicians grab like a drinking straw and slide a drinking straw in there so that the antenna can slip down inside the insulation real well. So. It's not too difficult, as long as you know about it, uh, make a nice hole, get it in the wall, you'll be just fine. We do have this hanging strap to hold the panel here for you. Um, your power wire, if you're, if you're uh, connecting to the barrel jack, we've got a nice little strain relief that goes around here and comes out the actual strain relief that's typically more used in a table mount installation. You shouldn't have to worry about it too much when you're on a wall. And then getting the panel closed can be a little bit of a challenge is what we see. So this is this is my, best practice number two. Best practice number one is get your antenna routed. Best practice number two is get it closed properly. And this again in our in-person class will usually teach you some tips and tricks on how to close this. Um, but you want to get it swung down. You want to get your power wire stuffed in the wall. You want to get your antenna stuffed in the wall here, swung down nice and tight. And then what I like to do is I actually like to pinch along these top four tabs. And if you actually pinch in kind of the direction this arrow is showing downward at a 45 degree angle, you'll actually hear these four tabs snap into place. They actually make a physical clicking sound of these snap tabs. So if you've mounted our panel before and you've struggled, try and get it as flat as possible. Make sure your back plate's not tweaked and then go ahead and just snap these four tabs with your fingers. But it's a, it's a 45 degree downward motion. It's not a straight on motion the way that these go in and you should be able to snap at each individual tab. If you can do those two things, if you can get the antenna routed, if you can get it snapped on the back plate correctly, the rest of your install is going to go really, really smooth. Those are, those are the two most important things of the entire install process. So make sure you practice those. Now, if you're going to do a table mount instead of a wall mount, that's pretty easy. You have this little back door that you'll use. It comes with that. If you're wall mounting, you'll throw the back door away and then the table stand just clicks into the wall mount holes. You want to make sure it physically snaps into place. Sometimes I see text just kind of rest this in those holes. But if you push up a little bit, you'll notice it actually snaps um, once in each hole. So that's another little tip there for you. Now, I, I normally would watch a video there. Uh, I've got a bunch of videos built into this training, but they really don't play well over the webinar. They end up real choppy and not good audio on your side, so I'm not gonna subject you to that. But I will tell you that on our dealer site and on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Qualsys, we have a lot of videos, um, including all the videos I have here in my training today. So I encourage you to go watch that. Now, if you're gonna do an image sensor daughter card, now would be the time to do that. You would just simply install the daughter card, connect the antenna, and power up your panel, and the panel would automatically sense that daughter card. Now, again, keep in mind, this daughter card uh, is not usable if you're using a PowerG panel. So just keep that in mind. All right, uh, so we'll skip past that video as well. So your panel's on the wall, you've got your antenna routed, you've got it snapped on the wall correctly, and your wires ran. Of course, now we're going to go ahead and connect up the power supply, positive to positive, negative to negative. You want to make sure and only use the power supply that we provide for you. Um, and then you're going to go ahead and press and hold the button on the right hand side for three seconds to power it up and that'll boot it up. Um, if you haven't yet created an alarm.com account, you would want to do that now before you proceed. Of course, you can do that anytime before this step, but the key is to do it 
now or, or before now. And the reason is, is the next couple steps are going to need to tap into this alarm.com account here. So you want to make sure and have that account created before you move any forward any further. Uh, step number five is get into advanced settings. So swipe down, go to settings, advanced settings, enter your installer code 1111, and then you want to run a cell test. So why do we want to run a cell test right now? First thing we do when we get it powered up, powered up is we want to get it connected and talking to the alarm.com backend. We want to get any dealer templates that you've set up being downloaded, your logo downloaded, weather, time, date. We really want to get that communicating with the backend. And in order to run a cell test, like I said, you have to have an alarm.com account pre-created. If you pull a panel out of the box, and try to run a cell test, it's gonna say zero out of five bars. It's gonna look like you don't have any service and the cell test is gonna fail. So make sure that you have that alarm.com account created. And, and what actually happens is you create the alarm.com account, then you go run a cell test, the alarm.com backend sees that cell test come through and they physically at that time go out and register the radio, the SIM card with Verizon. They get it all communicating, they get everything set up and then they return it'll return a cell signal strength to your panel and start the download and the, and the communication process. So very important that you get that up and running on cellular. Now, almost as important as that is Wi-Fi. Uh, again, remember Wi-Fi is used for dual path connectivity. It's used for software updates. It's used for Wi-Fi keypads, um, things like that. So we absolutely want to get you connected to the homeowner's Wi-Fi if they have it. And uh, that's a really easy process to do. You just touch Wi-Fi and choose the network. A keyboard pops up and you type in your, your network key. So once we're connected to cell tests and Wi-Fi, now we're gonna go ahead and check for an update. Um, you know, we, we, are, we do three to four updates a year on average. And um, you know, from the time that uh, you got inventory from our hub to your distributor, from your distributor to you, from your truck to your, to your homeowner's home, we may have launched new software. We always try and manufacture and ship on the latest and greatest software, but in the, inevitably there is going to be some lag in that process. And uh, you know, at some point we will launch new software and the stuff on, on your truck is going to be outdated. So you simply want to upgrade it at the time of install. And again, that uses Wi-Fi. Um, so you just check for an update and it's going to automatically pull down the latest and greatest software. Now, I'm not going to cover it in too much detail here, but if you don't have Wi-Fi in the home, we actually also host the uh, latest software on our dealer site, which we'll talk about at the end of the training. And you can download that onto an SD card. So I have a lot of technicians out there who simply carry an SD card in their tool bag. It becomes like their screwdriver, it becomes a tool for them. And they can simply slide the SD card into the panel, update the software, it takes about two, three minutes off an SD card, and then take the SD card out and they're on their way. So that's a great way to do it as well if you don't have Wi-Fi in the home. Uh, but Wi-Fi, you know, you, then you got to make sure you keep your SD cards up to date and you stay up, you stay current with us. You're not loading old software off an SD card. So it takes a little more work on your end to maintain that SD card. If you go over Wi-Fi, uh, we do the work on our end and we'll automatically send down whatever's the latest and greatest. Okay, next you're going to go ahead and install your devices, and this is really easy to do. You touch the drill, you go to installation, you go to devices, and then you go to security sensors, auto learn, you tamper the sensor, you customize it, you touch add new. Now, I'm going to walk you through what that looks like on an actual panel here. So here's the pathway, settings, advanced settings, enter your code, installation, devices, security sensors. I would touch auto learn, and my panel is going to look just like this. It's going to show any devices that are already learned in and then it's sitting here waiting for you to trip a sensor. So all I would do is I would tamper or I would open and close the sensor either way. And I'm going to go ahead and get a sensor ID that pops up on my panel. Now this sensor ID should match the sticker on the box. It'll match the sticker on the device itself. So a couple ways you can make sure that the receiver is picking up the device you want it to pick up. I would touch OK to continue. And I'm going to get uh, a drop down menu that looks pretty similar to this. Um, first and foremost, you have your sensor ID auto filled. You've got your sensor type. So I can go ahead and select what type of sensor is this? Is this a door window, a motion, a glass break? And oftentimes we'll have this pre filled out for you. Kind of depends the device. But a lot of devices, we already know what they are. 
And so if we know it's a motion sensor, we'll have this defaulted to motion sensor for you. If we know it's a door window, we'll have it defaulted to door window. If we don't know what type of device it is, we'll just say it's a door window and you would come here and manually change it. Now, when you manually change the sensor type or when, the, when you set the sensor type, all of the following items automatically change to try to speed you up. So they're all defaulted based on sensor type. One is gonna be sensor name. And sensor name can be things like front door, back door, garage door. We've got a whole bunch of preset names in there. But we also have the ability to do custom description. And you can type in whatever name you want here, um, up to 26 characters. And whatever you type, the panel will actually say. So we have full custom text-to-speech. So if you type John's bedroom window and you leave the chime and the voice on, when the, when the sensor is opened, it'll actually say John's bedroom window. So we don't have a fixed vocabulary, which is pretty cool. The next drop down down is your chime type. We have 10 different chimes. That's the beep boop, for lack of a better term, the little beep that happens when the, when the sensor is opened. And you can have different chimes for different sensors. You would then set the sensor group. And the sensor group is uh, the sensor behavior, right? This is is it an entry exit? Is it a perimeter? Is it a entry exit long delay? Um, instant interior, you know, what type of device is this? How do you want this device to behave? So group 10 is gonna be your normal entry exit delay. And then you can choose to turn the voice on or off. And again, this is, you know, John's bedroom window open. Do you want it to talk or not for that zone? So that's settable by zone, which is pretty cool. And then you hit add new and you're done. It adds right to your list and it's waiting for another. So from the same page, you can continually trip devices and they'll just learn right in and you can configure them and keep on going. Um, Z-Wave. So Z-Wave is pretty similar, um, but there's a, a few differences on Z-Wave that we're going to want to talk about. Um, one of the differences is um, that you want to clear it before you add it. So that's the best practice. Um, sometimes Z-Wave devices, even when they're new directly from the factory, um, they need to be cleared. Um, and um, so we recommend that you on Z-Wave you go into clear device then you go to add device so this will walk you through it here so here I am we'll pretend we've already cleared this I don't have this built into my into my manual here or my PowerPoint here but um, we'll go to settings advanced settings enter code installation devices Z-Wave devices we'll click add device and again it will show a list of all the devices that are added to the network I simply touch include on the panel. It's searching for the device. Uh, at this point, I would press the button on the device, the include button on the device itself, and it would find it. It would say it's you know discover device 12, ret retrieving device details, and then boom, it would pop in automatically. And with Z-Wave, we know what type of device this is based on the command class. So we're gonna know if this is a door lock or a thermostat or a light or something like that. We're going to have that all set up and defaulted for you. We'll have some quick names. You can change it from front door to back door, garage door. You can give it a custom name, laundry door, whatever you want. And then you would hit add new or add, and it would add it to your list, laundry door. So really, really easy right from the, the panel interface to add Z-Wave. Um, let's talk. I, uh, we have a really good Z-Wave video. Again, it's not going to play on here, but it is a very good video. So I encourage you to go to our website and watch it. Um, but let's talk real quick about Z-Wave networking. Um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that Z-Wave is a mesh network. So if I want to talk to this door lock at the other end of the house, I have to build a pathway to get to that door lock. In this case, I'm using a thermostat, I'm using a light bulb, I'm using a water device. I'm, I'm eventually talking to the door lock. Now, the problem with this scenario is that that door lock is relying on a single pathway to get back to the panel. And if something happens along that pathway, if my thermostat goes down, um, something like that, all the devices behind that are going to break, right? So ideally with Z-Wave, we want to create multiple pathways. Here you see I've got an energy meter and a dedicated repeater. And now you can see I've created a true mesh network uh, where the lock has multiple different pathways that it can travel uh, in order to get back to the panel. And this type of network is going to be the most robust uh, network that you can have where you've got a true mesh with different pathways uh, where everything can kind of go one way or the other. And Z-Wave is smart enough to kind of figure itself out. 
You can also manually re reconfigure the network or rediscover the network and it will kind of manually map. Um, and then we've got some really cool tools, which we'll show you here in a minute that show you how you can actually see what this network is doing. Let's talk about some additional device programming. Um, so we've talked about uh, the quick guide, right? We've gone over uh, cellular and connecting to Wi-Fi, upgrading the software. We've talked about adding basic security sensors and basic Z-Wave sensors. Let's talk about a few other types of devices. Uh, first being Bluetooth. So with Bluetooth, um, it, again, this is very similar to a, a security sensor. You've got several different things you can do. You can add, you can edit, you can delete, things like that. Um, and so I'm gonna go into uh, my menu here, settings, advanced settings, enter my code, installation, devices. This should all look very familiar by now. I'm in my device menu. I'm not gonna pick security. I'm not gonna pick Z-Wave. I'm gonna pick Bluetooth devices. And from Bluetooth devices, I've got a couple different options. I've got settings. I've got add, edit, remove all, delete, things like that. Let's talk about settings real quick. So I want to go into settings, and the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to enable the Bluetooth radio. So it's a simple checkbox, you enable it. The next thing you want to do is you want to enable the Bluetooth disarm feature. So this is the radio, this is the actual disarm feature. Make sure the feature's on. And then you'll want to set the actual Bluetooth disarm timeout. And the default is 10 minutes. And think of this like an exit delay, but a separate exit delay for Bluetooth. So uh, if we left it at the default at 10 minutes, I would arm away. I would have to leave for at least 10 minutes before I could come home and have the panel automatically disarm. Now, like I said, this acts like an extended exit delay. Reason being, maybe you're in your driveway, you know, you've armed the system, you're in your driveway, you're buckling the kids in the car seat, um, you're taking longer than you thought to leave. You don't necessarily want your panel to automatically disarm, you know, 60 seconds after you arm. Um, so this gives you extra time, and this is configurable, 1, 5, 10, 20, all the way up to 30 minutes uh, that you can have this Bluetooth disarm timeout. So once we've got the Bluetooth configured the way we want, now we'd go ahead and simply add a device. I go to Bluetooth devices, add device, <clears throat> and uh, it'll actually pull up all the available devices that, uh, that it can see. And here you can see it's finding my phone. Um, so... Uh, this follows a very standard Bluetooth setup. It should kind of walk you through really easy. You'll get a pairing screen on the panel. You get a pairing screen on your phone. You simply hit pair on the panel, then pair on the phone. And I'll say added successfully, and it adds it to your paired devices list. Now, something I want to talk about is that um, uh, when it's in your paired devices list, um, it's actually going to show paired on the panel, but on your phone, it's going to say not connected we do what's called a passive pairing, and that's totally normal. So paired on the panel, on my phone, my iPhone will say not connected to the panel. That's normal, that allows me to connect to other Bluetooth devices, my headset, things like that, and still be able to have the panel control the device or, or sense the device and disarm based on the device proximity. A um, Couple other things, when I mentioned panel glass break detector, remember I said it's just a setting, you would go in here to installation, installer dealer settings, you can simply enable the panel glass break detector. When I hit that checkbox, it'll automatically jump you over to zone programming. Everything is defaulted for you. You can change it to away or stay and then hit save. You can change the sensitivity level, normal or low, depending on the environment. Like I said, uh, 15 feet line of sight. Uh, we protect all different kinds of glass, kind of the most common glass. Um, Armed away or armed stay now. Stay is a new feature, so my PowerPoint's not updated yet here. And we actually even have a glass break test file. So you can log on to our dealer site. You can download the, the, the glass break sound app. It's basically a sound, a wave file that you can play off your smartphone, simulates the sound of breaking glass, and will actually trip our glass break detector on our panel. It's a design test. It's designed to trip that. That way you can uh, test it, you can trigger a signal to a central station if you need to get a signal out for your, your testing procedure at the end of your install. We also have another test built on the panel as well. Um, uh, this is right inside of our system tests. You can basically do a clap test to verify that the microphones are listening. You can use your wave file um, to actually do a real glass break test. The circle will be yellow for your clap test, green for your uh, 
you know, your glass break test. So you can totally tell that it's, it's sensing sound and it's differentiating between the sound of breaking glass and other sounds that it's listening to, which is pretty cool. Here's for the panel motion detector. It's right below panel glass break detector. Again, you can enable it. It'll jump you over to zone programming. It's pre-set up, group 25, safety motion only, which uh, you know won't dispatch the police. It just becomes a data point in the ecosystem. Okay, the IQ remote, the secondary keypad. This is our Wi-Fi based secondary keypad. Here you see it in the basement of a home. Uh, it's sleek, it can be on a wall, it can be on a table. Um, this is really easy to pair. The key here is they both need to be on the same Wi-Fi network. So you either need to have the uh, secondary keypad paired directly to the panel access point or just on the same Wi-Fi network that the main panel's on. If it's on the same Wi-Fi network that the main panel's on or compared to the access point, they'll kind of automatically find each other. So again, you come in here to devices and we're gonna select Wi-Fi devices this time. Not security, not Z-Wave, not Bluetooth, but Wi-Fi. You'll hit add device. You'll hit pair on the panel and it will automatically, you'll hit pair on the remote. It'll automatically go out and find the remote on the network and pair it, that simple. It'll give it a default name of IQ Remote 1, but you could edit that name if you want. So if you wanna edit that to be a master bedroom keypad or basement keypad or something like that, you could do that very simply. And the cool thing about the remote is it's going to mimic the entire user interface. So it's got lights, locks, thermostats, garage doors, security, weather, time, date, chimes, voices, all that kind of stuff. It has a little built-in siren on it. Um, so it's a really robust device uh, that can mimic a lot of what the panel can do. And we won't watch that, uh, that video. So let's talk about some key programming fields here. A uh, couple other things, I'm gonna blaze through these here because I don't wanna spend too much time on these. I'd rather talk about some other stuff. There, there are some key programming fields for the most part. Uh, most people leave most of these at the factory defaults, but if you want to change some of these, you certainly can. Um, we've got two different buckets for loss of supervision or for RF sensors. Regular sensors are, are defaulted to 24-hour RF supervision window, and life safety sensors are defaulted to a four-hour supervision window. It's a tighter supervision window for, for life safety, which is standard, so smoke detectors and carbons. Um, Keep in mind, smoke detectors and carbons can't be repeated. Couple that with a tighter supervision window. You definitely wanna make sure that your smokes and carbons have are in range. Use your sensor test, make sure they're in range of the panel because it's a much tighter check-in window from an RF perspective. A uh, couple other things that you have, you have access to. We talked about panel motion and panel glass break already. There's also a different setting. We call this open close reports allowed for auto learn. The default is that this is enabled. This is what allows you to auto learn a sensor just by opening and closing it. Now, if you have a lot of sensors in a home and people are coming and going and opening and closing things all over the place uh, as you're trying to do your learning routine and you're learning in things you don't want to learn in and out of order and things like that, you can simply come in and you can turn this setting off. If you turn this setting off, then the sensors require a physical tamper in order to be able in order to learn them into the system. So in some cases, this is super handy because you can just open and close a door. In other cases where there's a lot of traffic, you may not want that, that easy learning process. You may want to create it a little, make it a little more purposeful by tampering the device. A couple other things we have here uh, inside the siren and alarms bucket, we have a setting called panel sirens. And you can choose to have the sirens on. You can choose to have the sirens off, not recommended. Um, but the feature I want to point out for you is the installer test mode. This is a cool mode. If you set it to installer test mode, we automatically turn off the siren for 30 minutes, and then it will automatically turn itself back to the on state. Um, so that's great if you're testing late at night, if you're testing and the baby's sleeping or something like that, you're in a customer's home and you don't wanna set off a loud siren, installer test mode is a great thing to use. That way you don't come here and turn off the sirens and forget to turn it back on later. So that's a nice feature. Uh, duress authentication. So if you like to set up duress codes, there's something you have to do in order to be able to do that. You first have to come into this setting and you have to enable duress authentication. Once duress authentication is enabled, you can actually, we'll actually pre-create a duress code for you. It'll be in the user code programming menu, which I'll show you in a minute. 
and you can just go in and edit that duress code to be whatever you want it to be. So turn on duress authentication, edit the duress code to whatever you'd like. A couple other settings that are that uh, we get questions about from time to time: auto stay and arm stay no delay. So auto stay is uh, what some people would call unvacated premise, where I arm away and then I don't actually leave. Uh, the panel knows I haven't left because no exit door was violated, and it automatically downgrades it to stay. Um, if you if you like that, it's a false alarm reduction feature. The, the default is this is enabled. If for some reason you want to be able to arm away and then stay home, you would want to turn this feature off for them. Um, and then we've got arm stay no delay. Again, the default here is enabled. And you'll notice on the Qualsys panel that when you arm stay, there is no exit delay. So if I want to do the opposite, I want to arm stay, but I want to leave, you may want to turn this feature off as well. And that would then give them an exit delay on stay. A couple other settings for the camera. Um, there's a lot of different settings we can use to manage the, the physical panel camera. One, you can turn disarm photos or on or off. Maybe you've got a customer who uh, is a bit paranoid and they don't want their picture taken. You can simply turn off the camera. Um, same with alarm videos, alarm photos. You can even have it take a picture when you get into settings. So if you want to know when somebody's accessing settings, you could come turn that on as well. So a couple different options there for your panel camera. User management, typically this is uh, set up by the homeowner. It can either be set up on alarm.com or they can program right from the panel interface. Uh, we support 242 user codes, so a lot. Uh, that includes the dealer, installer, and duress code. So that'd be 239 other codes. You can have master, you can have user, guest, things like that. You can set an expiration date on, uh, on uh, the codes so that they automatically expire. Maybe you set up a guest code for a contractor and you give it an expiration date so that the code automatically expires on a certain day. Uh, the About menu is a really great menu for installers. I always encourage people to go here. This is going to tell you a lot about what you're installing. I can look at the battery uh, status. and All these menus expand, by the way. I can look at the battery status. I can look at my software. You know, What software am I running? Do I need an upgrade? I can look at the different versions of hardware. I can look at my cellular status. What's my signal strength? Am I connected? How many bars of service do I have? What about my Z-Wave? What about my Wi-Fi and my MAC address, my SSID? Um, am I actually getting internet on my Wi-Fi or am I just connected to the local router? You can see all that right here from the Wi-Fi information screen. This is a great, a great page I just recommend. all kinds of different tests. Let's talk about some of the most uh, most common ones. So your Wi-Fi test, this quickly pings the router. This does not check whether or not you have internet. This verifies how good the connection is to the router inside the home. So you can run this to make sure that that's in range and talking nicely. Um, the sensor test I talked about earlier, I showed you that really pretty slide with the graphing, but let's talk a little bit more in detail about how that actually works. So when you go to the sensor test, you're going to see a screenshot that looks kind of like this. And this is what I call your sensor report card. And this is designed so that at a glance, you can quickly see how well the sensors are communicating inside your home. Um, and it will show, in this case, this, I've, this home only has three sensors. But if you have 30 sensors, they would all show here. They're going to show good, strong, poor, excellent, things like that. They'll be color coded, green, yellow, or red. And so at a glance, you can quickly see, are all your sensors communicating well? Now, if you have any sensors that are not in the green, if you have any sensors that are either yellow or red, at that point, you would want to go do further troubleshooting. So we're going to, uh, there's a little graphing icon next to every single sensor, and we're going to go look at the graph. So if we go look at a graph for a sensor that's yellow or red, it's going to look something like this. Now, this sensor's in the green still. Um, 
but the green dots represent a state change. So open, close, open, close, open, close, open, close. And you can kind of see the slight fluctuations in the sensor signal strength here as it opens and closes. Maybe the sensor is physically moving in space and changing it slightly as it opens and closes um, on this sensor here. Um, but what I want to focus on is the yellow and red line here on the graph. And like I said before, these yellow and red lines actually move at every single install. They're dynamically adjusted for that environment. And it's based on something we call the noise floor. And if you're back on this page here and you want to look at your noise floor, you can go to your little cog here at the top. You can click on it and there's a button that says noise floor. And it will actually graph the noise floor in the home. So the noise floor, if this was a 319 radio, the noise floor is the threshold at which the panel can theoretically no longer distinguish between the surrounding interference and noise and a sensor transmission coming into it. I kind of like to think of it in my head of like white static on a TV, right? It just doesn't really get anything at that point. So what we do is we, we measure the noise floor in the background. And you, again, you can see that if you want, but we're measuring it in the background. And then we go, we move up 6 dB, these are negative numbers, so we go up 6 dB. So in this graph, if my red line is drawn at 74 dBm, negative 74 here, that means my noise floor is 80. Now this happens to be a very noisy environment, by the way. Typically this red line would be down about 10 more dB. Um, and the noisier the, noisier the environment, the, the lower the, the noise floor, um, the higher the red line, the higher the yellow line here. Uh, the less receive capability I'm going to have on my system. So anyway, we have the noise floor. We go up 6 dB. We draw a red line. That's your ultra caution line. Uh, we call it critical here in the manual, right? So we're still sensing it. We're getting it. We're, we're getting the opens, the closes. We're plotting them on a graph, but they are getting very close to the noise floor. So if something changes in the environment, um, humidity, temperature, furniture, uh, you name it, if something changes in that environment, you're close enough to the noise floor, you're within 6 dB of the noise floor, you are likely to have a failure at some point in time. That's what we say here in the manual. Uh, RF failures are likely. So if you leave a sensor in the red, I can pretty much guarantee you you're going to go back to that house at some point for an RF failure. Might not be today, might not be tomorrow, might not be a week from now, could be a month from now, who knows? It depends on the environment, depends on how close to that noise floor you are. But if you leave a sensor in the red, even though it's working, it's chiming, you're probably going to have a failure in the future. Then we go another 6 dB and we draw a yellow line. So this yellow line is your caution line. Signal strength is still poor and potential RF failures could occur, right? So you might get an RF failure. You're, you're somewhere between negative 6 or you're somewhere between 6 and 12 dB away from the noise floor. So you got a little more buffer, you're not right up against it, but um, you're still caution, right? And then anything above the yellow line is going to be green, where you're, you're more than 12 dB away from the noise floor, plenty of margin built into the system, pretty much not going to have a failure if, if anything in the green. So this is an amazing tool that really helps you troubleshoot the RF, makes the invisible visible, and uh, helps you understand kind of what's going on in that RF environment. Now, if you have a a sensor in the yellow or in the red, what do you do about it? Well, there's a couple options. First, remember that RF pigtail antenna you were supposed to stick into the wall? That's the number one determining factor of received sensitivity. So if you can make sure that that's cleanly routed, you might get these yellow and red lines to drop down. And if they drop down, now you're building margin into the system. If you can get the environment to be quieter, less interference, and that can happen with that RF pigtail antenna. So make sure that's routed correctly. Try and get the environment as quiet as you can. If your environment's as quiet as possible, the other thing you can do is you can move the sensor. Maybe it's vertical on the door, you move it to horizontal. Maybe it's on the bottom of the window, you move it to the top of the window. And then you can come back and you can actually check on the graph. Go open and close it a few times in the new location, come check on the graph. Did I make it worse or did I make it better? And so you actually get to see as you move things, what effect you're having. Are you adding margin or are you taking away margin? Um, and sometimes just switching a sensor from horizontal to vertical will do it. That changes the radiation pattern of the antenna. 
changes the reflections inside the house as these packets and this RF goes bouncing around and is going to change how, how strong it reports into the panel. If you do all that and you still can't get it above the yellow or above the red, then you know it's time to, do, to, to add a repeater, right? And now you don't have to come back later and add a repeater. You can add it now and avoid the service call. Talk to the customer, show the customer the graph, let them see what you're seeing, and that gives you a, a lot of ammo for explaining why you need a repeater and how the system is actually working uh, to make it more reliable. So very cool tool here. Uh, the four Z-Wave tools. So moving off of sensors and moving on to Z-Wave, uh, the first tool is rediscover the network. This is pretty easy. You simply simply select all the nodes. You hit rediscover. This goes out and remaps the Z-Wave network. And you want to do this once all the Z-Wave devices are in their final location. Um, you can do a quick Z-Wave test. This is like a handshake test. So you can run a quick test between devices in the panel, give it a quick handshake, see if they're talking to each other or to the panel. You've got counters. Now counters is a really cool way to troubleshoot a system because this gives you empirical data on how many commands are passing and how many commands are failing on the, on the system. So if a customer says, hey, I've got this living room light and uh, you know sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work when I try to control it, you would physically be able to come into the counters here and see that happening. So you would have you know, a lot of acknowledged commands and a lot of failed commands. And then you can come in and you can look at the detail view and you can see that by node. So on my screenshot here, my node three, my light, 100% of the commands have passed. None have failed. On my IQ outlet, almost all the commands have passed. Only one command has failed. Now that's minuscule in compared to the number of commands that have passed. So this is a very reliable network. What you want to shoot for is what we call a 98% efficient network. So 98% of your commands should pass only with only 2% failing. Below that rate, you're going to have customer frustrations where they're not going to be happy with the performance of their network. You would come back, you would look at which nodes were failing. Based on which nodes were failing, you would add some additional devices, you would rediscover the network, you'd check the counters again and see if it's passing more um, frequently. Now, the other cool thing you can do is you can actually view a topology of the network in the star diagram. We call this the Z-Wave uh, map with the Z-Wave diagnostic tool. And this actually shows the last working route. So even though a lot of these devices are gonna have multiple pathways they can take, this is showing the pathway it actually took. So no more plugging in a bunch of lamp modules, kind of throwing mud at the wall to see what sticks and hoping that they're doing something. You can physically plug in one lamp module rediscover the network, control the lock, and see if it actually used that lamp module to get back to your panel. Um, so this, this map will change, it's dynamic, it's 100% based on um, what's working or what, what the last working route was. And so it might change from time to time, and sometimes Z-Wave kind of takes different routes each time, but most of the time it kind of settles in to the way that it wants to go each, each time. We have a panel test, this will go through and run a a quick test on all the systems on the panel. It'll arm it, it'll disarm it, it'll check the camera, it'll check the siren, stuff like that. Okay, um, we're nearing the end of the presentation here. I wanna talk briefly about the user interface and then I wanna talk about uh, how you get support and help if you need it, and then we will be done. So the user interface, uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Everything is a modern swipe, up, down, left, right. Uh, should be very easy to use. Um, generally, if you have a pop-up, you can dismiss it with, by swiping it away, or you can touch outside the box in the gray area, in the, the kind of masked off area, and that'll dismiss the pop-up box as well. Here's an example of the four-day weather forecast that you get when you touch the weather icon. Um, you've got the message center on the top, right? So this was the envelope, it can also be the dealer icon. You've got your contact information. You've got video tutorials, again, 15 or 16 different videos here that, that uh, can even be customized um, to have your brand on them. Um, messages and alerts, so these are your red bubble alerts. On the bottom, and this is static, so this never changes depending on which page you're on, is your emergency buttons. You've got police, fire, and emergency. You can do a silent police or silent emergency panic if you need to. 
on the security page or the arming page, you've got your uh, sensor list and it will show all the active sensors uh, in this filter window or you can look at all of your sensors if you'd like. Uh, you've got the disarm uh, icon, so I would touch that to arm. And when I touch that to arm, the default is what we call simple arming. And they, we just simply give you stay and obey. That's all we give you. It's meant to be very, very easy to use and not confusing. If you have a more advanced user and they want to do some additional things like bypass a zone or turn off exit sounds or turn off the entry delay, things like that, there's a little tray on the right-hand side. There's an arrow, and they can expand the tray. And with the tray expanded, I can now choose which zones I want to bypass. Um, I, can, I can turn off my exit sounds and my entry delay, things like that. On my lights page, it's the second dot over. If you have any lights, again, we support up to 80 lights here and different uh, smart modules, which will give you energy status. Uh, if it's a dimmer, you'll have the dimmer capability here. You can either choose to touch the icons individually, or you can select them all and then turn them all on or turn them all off uh, directly from that side of the screen. Locks work a little bit different. Notice over here on my lock page, I have got two little bubbles. This means I have two locks paired in, and I can swipe up and down between the actual locks themselves and show that, or I can just choose to unlock or lock them all. And again, we support up to six locks, so you might have up to six little bubbles over here on the right, on the left-hand side. I swipe over again, I get thermostats. Again, very similar to my lock page, uh, up to six thermostats, so six little bubbles here on the left-hand side. Um, you can do heat, cool, or auto. Um, if it's on auto, you can set the, the minimum and the maximum temperatures right from the panel screen, and the thermostat will just stay between heat and cool automatically. You can change your fan. You can see your battery status, the current temp, all right here from this user interface, so very clean. Um, garage doors. If you do a Z-Wave garage door opener, that will actually show up directly on the screen. Again, we support up to six garage door openers, so six little bubbles over here on the right-hand side or I can open all, close all, or individually here by touching the icon. Uh, if you do the LiftMaster MyQ garage door opener, that's only gonna show up in your alarm.com app. We don't yet have access to show that on the screen, maybe one day, but right now we, we only display Z-Wave garage door openers as those are paired directly through the panel. Okay, this is our new feature, Live View. Remember this? So this is if I have any cameras. In this case, I've only got one camera. But you'd have all your camera list here, including your sky bell, and you can simply choose which camera you want to look at. Uh, touch the play icon and it will go full screen. So this is actually a picture outside of our office window here off an outdoor camera. And it was this past winter when we were developing this feature. You see the snow on the ground. And then click to exit. The last page on the panel is going to be what we call Manage My System. And Manage My System gives the homeowner the opportunity to help keep their system up to date and connected to Wi Fi. We find that homeowner, you know, dad runs out to Best Buy and buys a new router, and then boom, he forgets, you know, he reconnects everything in the home. He reconnects his three TVs and all his computers and iPads and phones and DVD players and Roku boxes. And, you know, people have 30 devices in their homes these days when they really count them all up. But the one thing they forget to reconnect is the panel. And so uh, this icon will actually turn red. Right from this icon, the homeowner can reconnect to their Wi-Fi network all by themselves. Um, they also have the ability to check for a software update. Uh, this is controlled when we post it on alarm.com. This can actually change, and, and the software can be updated directly from there if you guys want. And they can even uh, manage their Bluetooth devices right from there. Okay, so let's talk about support. We're basically done with the training here. I want to make sure you guys know that we have a, a huge support system there for you. Uh, first and foremost, we have our dealer portal. So if you do not yet have access to our dealer portal, make sure you sign up. Go to dealers.qualsys.com and click register. So dealers.qualsys.com and click register. Um, we will uh, grant you access and on here we have documentation and training videos and sales and marketing materials and images to load on your website and digital collateral um, all kinds of stuff we have a knowledge base you can uh, click on the little question mark here in the lower right hand side you can chat with the tech support agent you can submit a ticket directly to a tier 3 agent you get to bypass our tier 1 and tier 2 group if you use our website or our email uh, tech support at qualsys.com which is here so 
If you call 855-4-QUALSYS, we're open from 8 to 8 Eastern time. If you email us, that goes to a tier three agent in California um, uh, at our headquarters. Um, same as if you use this little uh, chat window down here, this question mark down here. So uh, want access, go to doers.qualsys.com and click register, like I said, lots of ways we can support you. We do these webinars every other Monday. Uh, we can do private webinars. We have a whole uh, team of what we call TAMs or technical account managers that are assigned to strategic accounts to help you with implementation and rollout and training and questions. Uh, we fly all over the country and help with that. So uh, we absolutely want you to, to feel supported. Uh, we have our Facebook page. Um, we do a lot of marketing campaigns and email updates. Uh, we post TSBs, technical service bulletins, with lots of good information right here under our support tab. Um, so really grateful for you guys to join today. I feel like I've been talking nonstop for two hours. We had to fly to fit that in, but uh, looks like almost everybody's still on. So I appreciate everybody's attendance. Um, really grateful again to have you guys on and we'll do this every two weeks. So if you have other techs or people that need this training, please have them sign up and register as we send these out. And that is all we have for you guys today. So have a great day and uh, I'll stay on here for a few minutes to answer more questions in the chat queue, and then we'll go ahead and close it down. So thanks again, guys. Have a great day.